and we're ready to to get started. Uh, welcome everyone for this uh, webinar on uh, the rise and fall and uh, the rise again of uh, the digital uh, engineer with uh, Derek Turk. I'm uh, definitely not uh, Derek, but uh, before we get started, I'll just go through a few uh, meeting logistics. Uh, first of all, uh, we have around 100, 100 registered uh, participants uh, and uh, we're using something called Microsoft uh, Teams where everybody is muted by uh, default. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them down in the chat box uh, to uh, to the right. Uh, the presentation is about to take uh, between, between 45 to 60 uh, minutes and uh, the session will be recorded and distributed after uh, the uh, the uh, presentation and uh, the recording will be available on uh, our uh, online learning platform called Wilson Plus where we provide uh, live topical webinars like uh, this, but also uh, recorded uh, uh, on-demand uh, courses uh, and also uh, how-to videos using different uh, softwares. And most of the courses you find there is uh, typically related to what we do at uh, Whitson, which is specializing uh, on items within uh, PVT, well performance, gas EOR, gas condensates, uh, and whatnot. Um, if you're interested in joining some of our public courses, they're already up on, on um, wits.com slash uh, training for both this year and, and uh, next year. And that includes not only the uh, general theory courses, but also all our uh, software courses. The uh, next webinars you can also already find on the wits.com slash training. So there's uh, almost a webinar every single uh, month that we try to uh, go through different topics that we find uh, uh, interesting. And uh, this week, we're very lucky to have uh, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Derek Twerk, uh, to uh, be with us uh, to uh, today. His uh, background in terms of uh, education is uh, he has a bachelor's degree in, in mechanical engineering from UT uh, Austin. After that, he um, started to work for uh, for Devon for close to to five years in Devon Energy up in Oklahoma uh, City, and it's through that network that I've been lucky enough to to get to know uh, Derek. Uh, after that, he um, he has been uh, the president for. Uh, a company called uh, Terminus Data Science for uh, almost 10 years now. I think uh, probably in six months it will be a kind of a 10 year anniversary uh, there. Uh, and uh, most importantly for, for me, he's a super, super nice guy, very approachable if you meet him at uh, a technical conference and uh, does not shy a good, uh, good technical uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Derek, I'll just uh, stop sharing my uh, screen here and I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, take it away. Thanks, Matias. That, that's a very kind introduction. Um, sorry, I'm trying to launch my. Uh, here we go. So this this talk um, was originally the, the first, I guess, performance is maybe the word was at, at Saga Wisdom Sokva Becker earlier this year, and uh, Matias and and the Whitson crew were were generous enough to to um, offer the opportunity to presented again later in the year as a webinar. And uh, I really had this fear that maybe it won't age well. Um, I, I don't want to spoil the talk entirely, but I, I'll say a, a major theme is that the oil and gas industry has been a little bit too aggressive in trying to emulate what I'll, I will call big tech, the uh, the, the big technology and, and uh, Silicon Valley type companies. And so I think, you know, <laughs> The, the events of the last month or two have, have kind of shown that those guys may not be the, the be all and end all of um, how to run the digital world. So I'm I'm reasonably happy with the way this talk has aged. Um, I want to talk about the digital engineer and to uh, to talk about the digital engineer. I need to go back in time uh, to a to a world I remember, to a, a, a future that never came to pass for which I still feel a little bit of nostalgia and, and maybe uh, maybe some of you in the audience feel the same way. This article came out in SPE JPT uh, a couple weeks actually after I entered the industry, uh, graduated from college and, and went to work as an engineer. So uh, SPE JPT, October 2008, uh, Mirzad Madavi wrote an editorial called The Digital Petroleum Engineer, Carpe Diem. And I, as far as I can tell, this, this is the 
this is the first article to introduce the, the phrase digital engineer or digital petroleum engineer. And the way he described this concept is he says in the early days of industry software development, in other words, oil and gas industry software development, oil and gas professionals were teamed with IT professionals. And uh, while we've had some success with this approach, our industry also has a reputation for slow technology uptake. A digital petroleum engineer combines IT knowledge with oil and gas content. Uh, of course, we have many more people in the industry now who have both of these skill sets, but the bottom line is we need more, many more, and we need them now. It's not enough to let people merely find their way into these roles. We must chart a roadmap, steward the process, and identify new roles to provide the kind of transformation that these challenges demand. This article was really a call to arms. Um, his, his thesis was that as digital technology or software uh, continued to change the oil and gas industry, just as it was changing every other industry, uh, that the the, the the real um, the real way to to draw value from that was not going to be to turn to the existing technology or the existing software industry um, and and sort of become reliant on them, but but actually for petroleum engineers to take an active hand in understanding these technologies and managing um, these development processes. So what happened to the digital engineer? This is the digital engineer today. Uh, this was a recent, um, I suppose, editorial or, or um, I, well, I, I don't I don't want to name names here, but let's just say this was published in the SPE Way Ahead, which is the the Young Professionals magazine uh, in March 2021 by someone who ought to know better. Um, so this this is this is a take that was recently published, and I, I will say this is sadly not unique. <clears throat> When was the last time you saw for A squared plus B squared equals C squared? Unless you are a civil engineer, blah, 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 probably not since college. Even in those jobs, the Pythagorean theorem is built into software. Those who need it to do their work don't actually do the calculations. For most of us, it is disposable knowledge and the education system needs to stop pumping it into our brains. So rather than learning about the hypotenuse, high school should tell stories about Warren Buffett. That's a that's a exact quote. <laughs> Um, circling back to foster the right skill sets to master the digital oil field, coding is a critical capability. Great, I agree. However, rather than learning Iron Python or another programming language, quote, disposable knowledge, the new self-service, yada, 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 and the rest is basically a pitch for one of the low-code, no-code, drag-and-drop tools. Um, because why learn things? We don't need to learn things. We can just, we can just consume, right? So what the heck happened? Um, you know, when you compare 2008 to 2021, why did the expectations drop so drastically for a, a petroleum engineer who's engaged in digital technology, where the, the digital engineer we envisioned in 2008 might be writing code, certainly might be managing software projects, whether those be custom in-house development or liaising with a vendor. Uh, they would understand data management and still retain domain expertise in, say, completions or reservoir engineering or drilling. Whereas in 2021, the expectation appears to be uh, SQL, call a data engineer. You know, I, I'm an engineer. I don't write code. Regression, call a data scientist. And, you know, as that last uh, article kind of argued, I, I suppose, you know, we, why why memorize first principles or or why understand first principles? The program knows how to do it. And no, I don't know how to write the program, but I know how to drag and drop and maybe use someone else's program. As long as that GUI never changes up from under me. So what happened? Why? And and this is my theory for why. There there was just this one little thing that happened. Uh, so this is this is a, a chart from Google Ngrams, which lets you compare the frequency of search terms over time. Uh, I should I should caveat some of you may not know or or may not have been around uh, to know. End user programming is an old old phrase going back to the 70s at least for really a, a, a an idea that overlaps strongly with what we we called digital engineering in our industry. It was just the idea that domain experts should be able to write their own software um, to build their own tools and that computer scientists should feel responsible for building tools which in turn enabled those domain experts to 
build their own software to to you know sort of use the computer as I think the phrase was a bicycle for the mind as opposed to a uh, a device for passive consumption. So you'll notice this this end user programming kind of trucked along. It was a um, you know a, a relatively common uh, phrase for for some time, kind of at a a, a steady level of interest. And then starting in mid 2010, uh, this phrase data science started to get searched more and more. And by late 2012, this had kind of crossed over to become a more popular search term. Uh, of course, October 2012, Thomas Davenport and DJ Patil put out this article in Harvard Business Review called Data Scientist, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Many of you will probably remember this or at least remember the phrase. OK, so by 2013, data science is just continuing to to kind of expand and expand. And by 2019, which was the most recent data I was able to fetch, data science had eaten the world. And DJ Patil, whose name you might remember, uh, you know, somewhere back in 2015, he had actually been named the first US chief data scientist. So this this idea of data science really came along um, out of nowhere, as it were, although not really out of nowhere, of course, and, and sort of sucked all the air out of the room from uh, from end user programming. Um, it became a gold rush, right? Any anytime there's there's gold, there's a there's a perception that there's a, a new land grab or a new resource to be exploited, a new field to be uh, developed. People, you know, money rushes in and people rush in. And as with every gold rush, the best way to get rich was to sell shovels. Which leads me to talk about the data science revolution and its consequences, or or what I call the unicorn in captivity, um, because what I think we have really built in in our industry, unfortunately, uh, is a cargo cult. For those of you who, who've never heard the phrase, uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist, has a great essay called "Cargo Cult Science," and he makes an analogy between the way that that people sometimes try to perform the scientific process. Um, with with the cargo cults, which sprung up in in different Pacific islands after World War II. Uh, long story short, the, the 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 cargo cults worked like this. During World War II, um, many Pacific islands, where uh, the the local people had had very limited, if 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 any, contact uh, in their past with modern technology. Uh, suddenly found themselves thrust into a world where, say, the U.S. Navy or the Japanese Navy uh, rolled up on their island, started building air bases. Uh, men would come out and wave, um, you know, wands and planes would land and unload all kinds of wonderful things. And anthropologists found years after the war, going back and visiting some of these islands, that the locals, the natives, uh, would clear these long flat strips of beach and a guy would go out and wave sticks in the air waiting for a plane to, a, a plane to land and, and deliver the wonderful cargo you know all this this food and and water and things that these planes brought in during the war and of course to us that's that's kind of ludicrous but but Feynman points out that you know in in science and in business and in in many other realms of endeavor we we kind of do the same thing a, a cargo cult is really nothing more than looking at the form of a process and copying the form without understanding the function. Uh, there's a there's a phrase in software development of cargo cult programming where people kind of copy and paste maybe from Stack Overflow without understanding what it is that they're, you know, the, the code they found actually does and, and thus you end up sort of misusing things in ways that their their creators never never intended. Um, so what do I mean by cargo cult data science? The, the first thing I want to be clear about is that machine learning works. There is kind of a contrarian streak in our industry, and, and certainly you can find people who will argue until they're blue in the face that it's all a scam, it's all hype, there's nothing to it, it's just linear regression, you know, yada, yada. That's that's not true. I, I think it's become more and more clear in the last couple of years that there really is something to this wave of machine learning slash AI, if you must. Um, as a as an obvious, you know, sort of point, let, let's look at the the rise of um, 
image generation tools, right? This has been in the news a lot this year, things like Dolly or um, Stable Diffusion, where suddenly a lot of artists are discovering that uh, these AI tools let any old schmuck enter a few words as a prompt and get out some plausible looking, you know, a image result. So, I, you know, there are fields, self-driving cars come to mind. Um, things like language translation for many years come to mind where there, there really have been strong material gains in, um, in our ability to perform previously human-only tasks with machine learning. However, behind that is a lot of muscle and a lot of money and a lot of manpower from the big tech, the, the FANGs, if you will, although that acronym may not be the right acronym anymore after some of the slaughter that's happened this year. Um, but these companies, your, your Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google companies, they have, you know, in addition to deploying these, uh, these successes, they have uh, massive hiring budgets, massive headcounts. You know, I, I would argue Google and, and Amazon are the size, the, at least the GDP and, and probably population of, of uh, some of the smaller countries on earth. Massive compute power, right? And, and compute power on demand. You know, Amazon is not having to pay to spin up AWS uh, instances. They 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 own the thing, right? And I I suspect that's a lot of the the reason AWS exists in the first place. Um, perhaps most importantly, and I think most neglected, they have um, they have petabytes, if if not uh, whatever the next one up is, yottabytes, ex exabytes, I suppose, of uh, proprietary training data, or at least semi-proprietary training data. And so I ask, you know, to to an EMP audience, how many of those bullet points does your organization have? Be, because history repeats itself. So I, I, this again is kind of going back to about the time I entered the industry, and actually 2013 was the year I launched Terminus. Uh, this stuff was kind of in the water. I I don't I I, I will in no way claim credit for. Um, you know, sort of being being clever by jumping out at that time because this this was all anyone was talking about in that year. Uh, data science, right? Sexiest job of, of the 21st century. So in 2013, the way we all talked about data science is that it was it was portrayed as the intersection of this Venn diagram between um, programming skills or, or let's call them traditional IT slash software development skills, hacking skills in the in the diagram here. Uh, math and statistics knowledge, in other words, you know, in, in, in machine learning, and then the, the domain expertise. So the, the pitch was if, if you were, say, a petroleum engineer that had a, a decent grasp of your discipline and uh, some experience writing software to, to, to do technical calculations, and you had studied enough statistics to understand sort of the basics of machine learning, you could actually make a massive impact, a, you know, sort of a, a nonlinear uh, impact on a lot of problems the industry was facing by by bringing that combination of skills to bear, and and so you know that that idea is kind of where we got this this concept of the unicorn, right? Um, in the sense that a, a data scientist was a a unicorn, right? This rare person that had a crossover expertise. Now, when you think about it, it it shouldn't really be that rare. I think many of us in the audience are probably petroleum engineers. I was actually a mechanical engineer in school, but we took a similar curriculum. Um, and our our bachelor's degrees covered statistics to a to a small degree, and programming to a small degree. You know, we we have some of the the rudiments to get there. And at, at the time, the barrier to entry was was really quite low for anyone willing to step out and and sort of do a little bit of learning on their own. However, what was sort of started to happen is, you know, as this this unicorn word took off, this became more and more portrayed as something inaccessible, right? Um, and, and the phrase full stack started popping up, which is this thing we borrowed from web development where it's it's sort of equally silly, but uh, we'll, we'll revisit that in a moment. So, you know, it, what is a full stack data scientist? And I believe this was from, uh, I'm actually not sure who, who published this. Crisp DM though, that's a blast from the past. Um, anyhow, May 2018, this was a definition that was floated of a full stack data scientist uh, with someone who can support and execute a data science project from start to finish. So in other words, someone who can do their job that makes them full stack. Um, 
you know, similar by November 2013, we were already starting to see, um, you know, a, are you recruiting a data scientist or a unicorn? In other words, it's going to be challenging to find someone that has that mix of skills. So instead, buy an application. And if you look at the byline, you'll notice it's, oh yeah, it's by the CEO of a firm that sells the application. So obviously there's there's a little bit of the, uh, I think it was Upton Sinclair said it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. So even, you know, obviously with 20, 2013, one year after sort of the inflection point, you, you already had a lot of money coming in and, and sort of distorting the narrative here. Um, of course, history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. So by 2019, uh, we, we've got this sort of comedy where um, you've got, you know, four or five, six, seven different specialized roles on a team. Uh, you have data engineers, data warehouse engineers, data platform engineers, data infrastructure engineers, analytics engineers, data architects, and DevOps engineers, where previously this would have been one person. Um, we've defined a full stack data scientist who might be a myth or a unicorn. You know, two, two definitions. One is a data scientist who can understand and execute the whole end-to-end -end process. Um, another one is one who can understand the business needs. So in a sense, we, we have taken what would have been defined as basic competence in 2013 for this role and redefined that as, as sort of a mythic unicorn. I asked myself why. And I think one of the reasons is this, um, as I mentioned at the start of this section, I, I think a lot of this is driven by a, a, a sort of a desire to emulate the, the big tech companies. But the fundamental thing about the big tech companies is that they are big very, very big in a way that I don't think the average EMP organization can understand. I, I think even the the majors um, sort of, it, at least when it comes to to IT and, and digital technology, pale in comparison to the, the, the sort of levels of complexity that these companies have built. And I think there there is a, uh, a writer and an anthropologist named James C. Scott, who has a, a book called Seeing Like a State, um, it's an interesting book. It, his his thesis sort of only only lightly touches on what we're talking about here, but one of his points, or or maybe one of his main themes, is that certain institutions, and and he would include certain states, certain uh, corporations in in this, are what he calls high modernist institutions, and in high modernist institutions, sort of have this utopian view of technology, this this idea that if you can just order the world in a certain very precise way, uh, you know, you've, you, you'll you'll reach kind of the next level. You'll you'll create some perfect, you know, well oiled machine, right? And because these institutions are so big, when the map doesn't match the territory, they have the power to remake the territory rather than alter the map. Think about Google, right? Or or Amazon. Um, if they find that the world of, of data science is sort of inconvenient for the way they want to structure their organization, they've got the pull in, in terms of hiring power and compute power and you know the, the fact that they are one of the few places on earth where a PhD that wants to do research on the cutting edge of machine learning can actually go, um, they can kind of redefine it in their own image and, and they have. And so I think going back to James C. Scott, he has this this idea of legibility that that these kind of organizations, the the thing they really seek out and the thing they try to remake the world to have more of, is um, is what he calls legibility, which is is really just the the ability to to quantify and sort of write down a map or a, a diagram or a a nice clean representation of a big complex system. His book is, is honestly mostly about things like uh, rural farmers under feudalism being brought into more complex taxation schemes and having to rationalize things like uh, gift economies in a way that made sense to the king's tax collectors. Um, how did, for example, people in the like the Anglo-Saxon world, right, in, in England in medieval times, how did they get last names and, and why, right? You know, you weren't just John who was a blacksmith. Now the, you, you know, you were required to pay taxes. You were on a census somewhere. And so you became John Smith. And, and so this process of, of legibilitization is really what his book is about, which is, is really a tangent to what we're talking about here. Other than I think that the fangs, the big tech companies of the world, they operate in such a way that their goal is to make these kind of, of 
uh, I guess, subtle or nuanced job roles legible. And I think that's why you end up with things like data engineer, data scientist, platform engineer, DevOps, data ops engineer. Um, it's a way to make the this sort of nuanced structure of these projects legible to an organization um, that can't turn on a dime. And I, I think that recruiters and, and sort of cargo cults transmit these definitions to much smaller organizations like many of ours. So my argument for why, you know, it, one of the recurring problems I see in our industry and, and conversations I have is we, we've been at this data science and oil and gas thing for close to a decade now, or perhaps a little more. Um, and yet, you know, large scale success stories seem to be few and far between. Um, there are certainly some, especially in, in specific focus areas. But by and large, I, you know, the average engineer I talk to that interfaces with the data science team in their organization, and I, I actually believe that that sentence itself is a red flag, um, which, which we'll go into, and hopefully you kind of catch my drift on that. But you know, I, what, what I frequently hear is that the data science organization is siloed. No one over there understands the domain, understands the business, understands EMP, and, um, you know, these teams kind of churn and churn and churn on problems that may be irrelevant to begin with and, and then finally produce a solution that best case works in a vacuum, but but has very little applicability to to the business. And so I think a lot of the reason for that is that the, the job roles have been kind of salami sliced into nothingness. Um, you know, it, and and these roles are viewed perhaps more importantly as IT rather than business or engineering functions. And, and in the oil and gas world, unfortunately, that is a a cost center and it, it's where innovation kind of goes to die. I, IT is largely a gatekeeping and cost control function in, in my experience. And of course, it's kind of a gold rush atmosphere and, and that brings in a lot of snake oil salesmen. And, and you know, there's kind of a, I think at the executive level, sometimes there's a there's a cynical, there's a cynical view of data science as a, a check the box exercise. I mean, I've in, in my past, I've, I've also worked in numerical reservoir simulation and, and certainly encountered the um, you know, boss says we need simulation done. Well, what do you want answered? We don't know. Just do a simulation. OK, so there, there's a lot of that in data science. And I, I think, you know, fundamentally what it all comes down to is that engineers can't, won't or don't want to get involved. And I think that is the root issue behind a lot of the dysfunctions we see in data science and oil and gas. The good news is that all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. Uh, this is not a unique time in history. This is a cycle. Um, it's not a story that, that many people talk about. Some of that's because there's there's not a lot of people around who remember it. I've, I've been lucky enough to talk to some of them uh, before they retired, and, and I, I have a bad habit of reading history, which gets me in trouble from time to time. But you learn things. Um, one thing I learned is that the oil and gas industry has been historically actually at the forefront of uh, digital technology and, and software technology or or even computer science, applied computer science, let's call it. Uh, some examples, in the late 1980s, the Amico Research Center in Tulsa wrote a reservoir simulator in the lazy functional programming language Miranda. Now, this is not something that may be of sort of general interest or import. Um, those of you who might know me know that I am a, I'm a big proponent of functional programming. This is kind of a, it's a it's a slow burn, but it's a it's a growing area of programming language research and, and development. It's it's sort of finally achieving mainstream success in the last 10 or so years. Um, what is interesting, though, is that in the 80s, this was a, a totally um, sort of novel or or exciting new research area. And this reservoir simulator developed at Amico was actually to to that point in history, the largest program ever developed in that style. So this this was kind of out on the, the cutting edge of, of applied computer science research. Uh, Amico actually also held internal seminars for petroleum engineers on computer science, on programming techniques, and uh, other other topics in, in digital technology. Arco uh, in the early 1980s experimented with running reservoir simulation on a vector processor. So if you have ever read about GPU uh, computing or perhaps used a reservoir simulator that supports GPU acceleration, or maybe uh, if you got really lucky and got in a few years ago, maybe you've mined Bitcoins on a GPU and made some money that way and then lost it maybe. Um, but these, you know, it, it, vector processor that that's essentially what a GPU is. And um, 
you know, we, we've been we've been doing that since the 70s. In the early 1990s, we experimented with multi-layer neural networks with back propagation. Um, I, I kind of call those anatomically modern neural networks because that scaled up is essentially what deep learning is built on. All the all of the AI, almost all I'm rounding up uh, advances in the last 10 years or so have really come out of, of this field of neural networks. And we were using these uh, for all kinds of problems in the in the 90s, uh, drill bit wear diagnosis, um, identifying problems from dyno cards on on rod pumps. Um, and, and yes, at the time we called it artificial intelligence too. Most of this was published by petroleum engineers in SPE publications. So we we have done this. We have been at the forefront of AI, of machine learning, of software technology. What happened? Well, the AI winner happened. Actually, the, the second AI winner happened. This is a cyclical thing. Um, I always think of the, the city of Troy, if you if you know the story of the Trojan War. Um, we did not know until the 60s, I want to say, uh, some of the archaeological work that was done. Troy was not one city. Troy had, had, had been destroyed and rebuilt nine times. And so digital technology is a little bit like the city of Troy in, in that we, we burn it down and sort of rebuild it on this 10, 20 year cycle. AIs had multiple boom and bust type cycles uh, within, you know, a, a human lifetime. Obviously, computers aren't that old. Um, you know, in the 70s, we we had a hype cycle based around perceptrons, which are kind of like the, the single unit uh, neural networks are composed out of, right? Because a, it turns out even a single perceptron can do a lot of interesting things, um, except they're they're very limited as, as um, Minsky showed in, in uh, late 70s, I suppose, and that kind of busted the, the perceptron hype cycle. We had a whole cycle in the 80s based on symbolic logic, right? The Japanese were going to build a fifth generation computer and everything was going to be either built in Prolog, which is a logic programming language, or or it was going to be Lisp machines, which are this whole kind of uh, <laughs> evolutionary dead end of, of symbolic computing. And it turns out those were limited. You know, expert systems could do great things, but you know, they they had fundamental limitations and, and, and they, you know, and you had all these miniature kind of cycles in between, you know, back propagation sort of recovered neural networks from from extinction. And then, uh, you know, multi layer perceptrons kind of hit a limit in terms of how many layers you could stack up on the hardware of the 90s. And it wasn't until actually of all people, of course, the, the PC gamers kind of rescued us because they created this boom in cheap vector processors that led to the ability to, to do deep learning, which is just stacking deeper and deeper multi-layer uh, neural networks in the in the mid 2000s or early 2010s. My point is just this is cyclical, just like oil and gas. Um, this is not a, a teleological thing like some of your software vendors will show you where you start at the, the caveman point. You sort of work your way up the slope of, oh God, what is it, inferential and the descriptive, and then no, like who cares? It, that's that's bogus. It, it's a it's a cycle, just like everything else in our industry. It's a cycle. So winter is coming uh, inevitably, right? Because we as as much success as as AI ML has has had, it, it will hit limitations, and investors will lose interest. And you know, I, I think you're kind of seeing a tech bust happen right now, or at least a small one, which will probably take some of this with it. So it, what I would propose is that we can survive winter. Uh, we've survived it before. You know, you may have noticed that the dates on some of those worked out such that even as the sort of broader AI winter or bust set in in the late 80s, the oil and gas industry took the parts of that that had been sort of established as more mature technology and applied them to our own ends. Um, you know, AI is a moving target. In the in the 60s, simple pathfinding was was considered AI, and now it's in every video game, right? Um, I've got a, a silly example on the right from something I wrote for kind of a toy, which is the A star search algorithm. It's a it's an algorithm for finding a, a shortest path between two nodes in a graph. Uh, this was state of the art AI in the 60s, and now it's uh, you know 50 lines of code and pick your favorite language here, and you know anyone can kind of do it. So if yesterday's AI is today's fundamental algorithm, um, you know, what is what is today's AI? What, what will that look like tomorrow and how will we look back on it? And so my 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 final kind of call to arms is this. I, it's save the unicorns. Let's let's not let the the cynicism uh, of kind of the, the broader 
hype cycle take away our our ability to to make an impact in our industry. Uh, let's let's reject mythology and embrace evolution. I, I actually this this worked out by total chance. My my wife found this citation when I was developing this talk originally, and I I think it's perfect. It kind of ties everything together to the, the story I want to tell. So um, Umberto Eco has a, a book of of essays on what he calls intellectual misunderstandings, times in history when people have just kind of talked right past each other. And he tells the story of Marco Polo traveling to China looking for unicorns. Um, but true story, believe it or not, or at least too good to fact check. So Marco Polo was a merchant and uh, he'd read a lot of books about, you know, sort of the exotic lands of the world. And he was prepared to encounter unicorns. On his way home in Java, Indonesia, he saw some animals that resembled unicorns because they had a single horn. And because his entire cultural background prepared him to see unicorns, he identified them as unicorns. But because he was naive and honest, he could not refrain from telling the truth. And the truth was that the unicorns he saw were very different from those he grew up with. They were not white, but black. They had pelts like buffalo, and their hooves were as big as elephants. Their horns were not white, but black. Their tongues were spiky, and their heads looked like wild boars. In fact, what Marco Polo saw was the rhinoceros. So he says, the real problem of a critique of our own cultural models is to ask when we see a unicorn, if by any chance it is not a rhinoceros. So I propose let's let's embrace being unicorns. Let's embrace being the the uh, not the mythical unicorn, but the the very real rhinoceros. Um, I think when engineers understand digital technology and manage its application, our our industry leads the world in innovation. Um, I think when we step aside and become mere consumers of technology, we are just as subject to the hype cycle as anyone else. So let's revisit the digital engineer as rhinoceros. Um, I think there's, you know, how do we get there? I think there's no substitute for hands-on experience. I think that's something that we we kind of are, are too willing to forego. I think it is very easy. I, I see this, you know, Obviously, some of you know I, I'm fairly active in, in training uh, for engineers on some of these topics. And so I, I see a lot of material which is intended to teach engineers about software development or machine learning or AI. And I think it's very easy to fall into, into the trap of teaching vocabulary and learning vocabulary rather than understanding, right? Uh, Richard Feynman, I, I don't, there's not a pithy quote I can extract here, but if you just look up Richard Feynman uh, interview about birds, there's a great video. It's a couple minutes long. And um, the punchline is he tells a story about growing up with his dad. But he, he says, I learned very early the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. And of course, Depeche Mode weighed in on this topic too in the 80s. Uh, I think computer science and AI really will become to next century's engineer um, or, or this century's engineer, I, I guess. We're in the new century now. I'm old. <laughs> um, it, it just as calculus was in the, in the last century. It is not this set apart specialized field. It is just something every engineer needs to be familiar with. I think it's OK and, and actually good to be a generalist. Um, we need project managers. We need engineers as project managers who understand how things fit together and, and can help drive these digital technology projects in a direction that is actually. Uh, technically sound as well as as well as a, a, a creative right as as valuable to the to the business. Of course, you know, you, you'll hear this kind of facile argument a lot about, well, I don't need to know how an engine works to drive a car. But the problem is that that's not really the metaphor you're in, right? The real metaphor is you're trying to buy a car from a sleazy used car dealership. And, you know, if you don't even know what horsepower means, you're you're going to get in some trouble. And for that matter, you know, do you really want to think of yourself as just, you know, an average Joe car driver or we're engineers, damn it, right? Like, let's let's be kind of, you know, how many Formula One drivers would, would be proud to be ignorant that they don't know how their cars work? So, you know, as engineers, we we really, this is our responsibility. If not us, then who? And uh, with that, I will take questions and answers. I, I want to thank Whitson and, and Matthias again for organizing this, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and, and have a, a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, break for those of you in in uh, parts of the world that that have that. Yeah, hundred percent. I uh, I really like this um, Eric a lot. There was a you know I, I have a lot of questions and um, yeah, really good presentation again. Thanks again for sharing. Um, just a couple of questions uh, from, from your perspective, since you have kind of this unique or what I call unique 
uh, background from from the oil and gas industry, and you're you're very deep into this uh, this world of data science. Let's call it that. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, around 2015, 2016, 2017, we saw a ton of these new uh, startups within oil and gas uh, that was going to offer something revolutionary uh, uh, when it comes to the use of AI or machine learning or any of those buzzwords, maybe a mix of them, uh, to, to solve uh, all of the problems with the oil and gas industry. And it was tons of them. Uh, now, we, m- most of them are not around anymore. They're around in a very, very different fashion than what uh, at least was pitched in, in the beginning. Um, do, uh, I guess, what's your comments on that? And, and where do you see Kind of the biggest use cases of uh, of that type of technology uh, being deployed kind of successfully within our industry, the oil and gas industry. Yeah, so I, I guess I, I'm going to open with an anecdote, which is, and I again I won't name names. My my point's not to to tear down specific companies or or people, but when I when I first left Devon and started Terminus in 2013, I I took a meeting with one of the, I suppose. Yeah, like like Matias said, batch of of startups that was rushing into how can we use AI in, in and machine learning in oil and gas, and and these were um, these were people whose background was Silicon Valley, was a uh, very traditional well traditional <laughs> that's that may be an oxymoron the traditional software startup world, but you you sort of know what I mean the, the venture capital driven Silicon Valley move fast break things yada yada, and I remember talking to the the founder of one of these companies and I I asked him yeah their plan was essentially to you know um step one use ml step two question mark step three profit and I said it, it you know do you envision hiring reservoir engineers or petroleum engineers to to sort of help you design this product and I'll never forget the answer because his answer was well no I don't think so we're theoretical physicists how hard can it be and I thought, OK, that's that's kind of ridiculous. So, you know, needless to say, a couple of years later, I run across their booth at a conference and wouldn't you know, they've hired a reservoir engineer and the guy introduces himself as their you know, chief petroleum engineer. And because what they found is it, it's not it's not about wait, without even getting into the argument of whether that makes a damn lick of sense, you know, we're theoretical physicists. It's not about raw intellect, right? There's no it, it, it kind of going back to the tech companies are high modernist and maybe this is my hobby horse. I think there's a culture in in the Silicon Valley world that says like if you just point enough IQ at a problem it goes away, and that's that's not really true, right? There's there's um there's experience that matters, and and there's sort of domain specific knowledge that, that takes years to build up. So I, I two answers. One is I I think all of those companies that have survived, I have seen pivot in a direction that brings in tighter integration with petroleum engineers with the the actual EMP domain experts uh, to the point that the ones I see still being successful have a pretty tight feedback loop with um, with that world. Two, I suppose, in, in terms of like disciplines or, or topic areas where machine learning really seems to succeed in oil and gas. If you look at what's been successful in the broader world or, or where AI has really kind of blown us away with its ability to perform at a human level or, or above, it is on it, it. It's it's not on the things that we we sort of would have guessed or a lot of us would have guessed. Um, it's on things like language translation or image processing, and and the common denominator is that the you know deep learning has been very successful in applications where there are huge huge amounts of training data available. Deep learning is is almost magical. It, it seems to me in its ability to. Um, produce sort of near human level um, capability, but only at the expense of needing, you know, terabytes of input. And so when I look at problems in our industry where we have very large, you know, sets of training data available uh, with kind of these fuzzy, poorly understood relationships, it, it's all kind of like subsurface data, right? I, I think about logs, I think about seismic processing, you know, I, I would argue that seismic inversion. Uh, it's so <laughs> everyone's got their own vocabulary to talk about the same things, right? It's kind of like you talk to finance people, and they've got what they call the Greeks, half of which are not really Greek letters. You know, you've got Vega, Vama, whatever, whatever, and they've kind of like reinvented differential equations, but with their own terminology. The same's true in the in the subsurface geoscience world. Um, we don't call it, you know. Uh, 
neural networks for regression. We call it seismic inversion, but we've been doing it since the 80s and it works pretty darn well. Um, I, I see, you know, synthetic logs. That's that's been in terms of where people are really sort of applying, I guess what what I see is. Um, for lack of a better word, state of the art ML, it, it, it looks like things like that. Um, you know, it, it, in the in in closer to my world, which is more reservoir engineering and completions optimization, I think we have not big data. I, I think we have small weird data. We we've, we've got these odd heterogeneous sets of um, I'm not going to say unstructured. I don't believe in that. I, I think that's like all data has structure. You just don't know what it is yet. Um, but we certainly have data that's harder to integrate. And, and more importantly, the outcomes we care about from a, a reservoir engineering standpoint tend to be well level. And so even a, a large operator may have tens of thousands of data points as opposed to trillions, which makes some of these, you know, state of the art techniques much harder to apply. And, and so I, you know, if you ask me kind of what my vision is for how a successful application looks like there, it's a lot more like simple, simple models used to um, sort of directionally define relationships and, and augment understanding, but with a human in the loop, I, I don't think we're 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 sort of in the, the realm where you're going to have a perfect or, or near perfect accuracy on, on most of those problems. I, I guess one one place where you potentially can have thousand or like a lot of data, maybe enough uh, you would at least claim would be within a time series type of analysis where you can have hourly data or minute data or probably seconds on some of these walls and whatnot. But that's yeah. where, you know, like back back then in the time period when I talked, you know, I remember going to these conferences and stuff that was like, we're gonna take your data, time series data, we're gonna predict when the, you know, valve is failing or the equipment is failing or what your EORs will become just from like, feeding it to, to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was an AI algorithm, a machine learning, a combination. Yeah. Uh, but that kind of, uh, I didn't see that uh, become very successful. So what's your what's your thoughts on on, on time series data and these technologies in, in general? Yeah, predictive maintenance is a really tempting one. And I, you know, I've talked to, I've, I've never, dealt with it personally. I've, I've talked to to customers and, and other vendors over the years trying to make a dent in that. And I, you know, I my my only experience there is I've 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 got so my my wife and also a co-owner of Terminus, her background is in the uh the chemical industry. And and in the chemical industry they they do take no I, I won't say predictive maintenance, but they they take life cycle analysis and and maintenance tasks in general fairly seriously. Um, but they also go a pretty long way with sort of the, and I'm I'm going to put massive scare quotes on this because this this probably only goes back a century at most, but but with sort of old school statistical methods, right? So Weibull analysis and things like that. I I agree with Matthias. It, it's sort of it, it's tempting in that you you see the big data set and it and it feels like there should be something there. But I I also have not seen anyone who who seems to have made just a a massive leap in. Um, in the ability to predict failures or or optimize maintenance just by by feeding bigger data sets into an algorithm, I, I think the time series thing is. I'm gonna I'm gonna rag on another uh, company I will not name, but a, a, an event I I once heard about was the the new shiny data science team of an NENP uh, got very excited because they were going to use time series analysis to forecast well production. And it was like, have you guys ever heard of ARPS? I'm like, nope. Okay. So I and you know, not to say the ARPS is the the be all and end all of forecasting, but but my point was that there, there's sort of many of the time series we deal with, and again, I'm dragging things back to the reservoir world because that's what I, you know, sort of know best. They're not they're, they don't exist in a vacuum, right? We we don't need some uh, totally model agnostic algorithm to fit these. We have some physics based expectations of what they should look like. You know, if nothing else, pressure will decline over time. Production will decline over time. If you slap an RMA model on that that allows for like seasonality and you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's a it's a misfit. And, and so I think, you know, the more we can bring engineers into that loop, the better. Um, I would I would love to see, you know, a better 
better results out of out of the application of, of time series models. I, I know for a time in, in um, kind of the broader machine learning world, there was a lot of excitement around things like auto encoders and uh, recurrent neural networks. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I have not been, I have not been very deep in the state of the art in machine learning research and sort of what's current um, in that world. But um, I would I would love to see people make an honest attempt to apply those things to some of our, our authority or problems. Oh, great. Uh, we have one last question I'll um, I'll ask here before the hour is up. But uh, there's a question from Brendan. Uh, what do you see as the most long the low hanging fruits in terms of data science and oil and gas that uh, you see uh, you still see that most companies are not applying? Um, and why do you think they might be slow in adopting these um, data science techniques to, to projects? I'm going to answer the second half of that first. Um, I, I think the reason that in general the, the oil and gas industry is slow in kind of solving these, these obvious, quote unquote obvious, uh, digital slash data science slash uh, software, you know, projects is, is really just the incredible um, siloization of, of the skill sets. It, it's the fact that now the the um, sort of the world at large is telling us that you don't just need a engineer that knows, say, a little Python. Um, you need a data engineer because the data engineer writes the SQL and then the data scientist loads it into Pandas and performs an analysis. And then the, you know, if they build a model, they probably write it in some horrible Jupyter notebook and then pass it back to the data engineer who takes a glance at it, panics, calls a, I suppose, the real programmer, whatever they call that. Um, you know, and, and you end up with five people in the loop to, to put some basic linear regression model into production. Uh, none of whom is actually an engineer and none of whom is equipped to notice it like, hey, you did something that makes no physical sense here. So I, I kind of think that's, you know, I, those kind of effects are, are why things are slow. In terms of low hanging fruit, I, you know, if I limit it to data science, I would say there's a lot of value in just making it possible to quickly and visually look at relationships. I actually think more engineers and data scientists, rather than getting hung up on uh, predictive models and kind of fighting over the difference between an R squared of 0.6 and 0.7, which is not uncommon in reservoir and completions tasks. Um, maybe it's more valuable to go back and read Edward Tufte and, and really kind of think through how we can uh, more clearly present relevant information to decision makers. I, I see a lot of misses on that, you know, where someone spent a lot of time trying to to fit a model, but very little thinking about how to present the the raw data or the model for that matter. Um, and you know, I, so I don't I don't see. I think that I think that the may, maybe the focus on on predictive modeling and and I suppose chasing R squared above all else is is kind of a a garden path. I, I think we would do better to to pull back a little bit and look at things like basic process automation and uh, exploratory data analysis. I really like that as the kind of uh, a very good uh, way to wrap up this session, uh, Derek. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's Thanksgiving week. Uh, it's a big day tomorrow for at least us here in and, yeah. and, and the peril in which I guess where, where you're based out of. But uh, yeah. um, thanks again uh, and thanks all for for uh, for joining the, the call. Uh, I really loved it because it's uh, a little bit, uh, you know, it's in the in our our domain, but it's also a little bit uh, tang tangential, I guess. So it's uh, really fun to do that some sometimes as well. Uh, and with that, I uh, wish everybody a good uh, rest of the day and uh, we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks.